This is the third part of activity-based costing. We are now going to get into the first part of the implementation, which is first stage allocation, something that I call define and assign. Uh, and we'll see what, uh, what I mean by define and assign. But if you can remember define and assign, uh, that's first stage allocation. Number one is define. You must identify activities, activity cost pools, and activity measures. So let's say that you're interested in uh, um, tracking customers. You must design, you must uh, define the activities that center around a customer, uh, what the activity cost pool would look like, and what activity measure you're going to use. Now, that being said, this requires a lot of judgment. It's not easy. Starting an activity-based costing system from scratch and just moving into a system, a company, and saying, okay, well, let's design an ABC system. It is difficult and time-consuming. Even for the best seasoned professionals, this can be difficult and time-consuming because it requires a deep level of knowledge about the business processes involved in that business. So somebody can't just walk into a business cold and design an ABC system, not without a lot of help from management, from supervisors, from employees, to get an idea of what are the activities involved in each of the processes and to what do we assign the costs of those activities as it relates to only overhead costs. So it's not easy. But once we've done that, the next step is to assign the overhead costs to the cost pools. Once you have identified your activity cost pools and your activities, then you, des you just assign the cost to the cost pools. And I, I said in one of the first videos, think of a cost pool, an activity cost pool, as a T account, as a manufacturing overhead account for that activity. It isn't really. It's not. There's no journal entry here. It's not. But think of it that way. And you're assigning costs to these overhead pools. Notice that it's going in as a debit because we're assigning. Stage 1 allocation is to assign. Stage 2 is to allocate. We're just assigning right now. So let's have a look at, at, at sort of graphically what first stage allocation looks like. Let's say that we've identified some cost objects. And you know, if you're like me, you hate that word cost object. It's so abstract. Most cost objects are either a product or a customer. Either you're going to uh, build cost structures around a customer or around a product. That's pretty much the two things you're going to do. So when we talk about cost objects, we're thinking about costing out a product, everything about that product, or costing out a customer. Direct costs. These are traceable. There's no need to get involved with assigning these to activity cost pools. Why? Because you can trace them right to the product or you can trace them right to a customer. A customer either bought it or they didn't, right? Direct materials, direct labor, shipping expense, uh, uh, commission on sales, all of these things that can be traced directly to the product or to the customer, you just assign right away. Forget the activity cost pools. When we get to overhead costs, though, remember that we can both use both manufacturing and non-manufacturing costs as a product cost or as a customer cost. So what we would do is we take these overhead costs and we have all of these little sort of T accounts that are, that are overhead accounts for each activity. These we simply just called activity cost pools. And we will apportion these overhead costs to each of those little cost pools that we identified in step one. Now, not every cost will map to a cost pool. Some costs you can't trace to anything. They'll go in a category called other. So some of the uh, um, costs that you can trace, we've already been through these, the five uh, levels. Unit cost pools, product cost pools, customer cost pools, batch cost pools. When we start doing the problems and when we start doing the example in the book, this will start to become a little more clear. So just work with me here. On the other, remember they don't get assigned to anything. We call them organization sustaining activities. So the CEO salary, you can't really assign that to anything. You got to pay it no matter what you make or how much of anything you make, right? So that's, uh, that's assign, that's the define, number one, and assign, number two. I'll give you a sneak preview of where we're going after. 
Once we've assigned our costs to the activity cost pool, we calculate our activity rates. And this requires an estimate of the activity level of each activity. So look at that little red T account I drew in number two, manufacturing overhead for the activity. We assign some costs on one side. To allocate those costs to each of the units, we have to have a meth, uh, um, an estimate of the activity level associated with that T account for that manufacturing overhead for that cost pool, let's say. So we need two things. Just like a predetermined overhead rate, we need an estimate of the assigned overhead to whatever cost pool we have. And we're going to need an estimate of the activity level for that. Now, this has all been rather abstract. The book has a really great uh, company example. We're going to go through that, and I'm going to go through it now. So stick with me. Let's go through some of the exhibits. We're going to be using a company called Classic Brass to walk us through the <clears throat> first stage and second stage allocation in activity-based costing. There's just there's no way to do it abstractly. We really have to use a concrete example, and the book gives a good one. So. If you have the book, follow along. If you don't, I've uh, replicated just the uh, exhibits that are needed. Uh, you really should be working from the full book, so I do encourage that. But anyways, uh, for this chapter, I will, uh, I will put up uh, some of these exhibits so that we can see what we're doing. Have a look at what we have here. We have the income statement for the year ended of 2013. And we have a, a nice top line number on sales. There's our gross margin. But when we get to the bottom, we see that we have a loss. So when we're looking at just the income statement here, we sort of are a little bit puzzled as to where our loss is coming from. Uh, and this company sells two products. We'll learn that they, uh, they sell two particular products. So is it product one or product two that's causing trouble? Um, as the text explains, the, the, uh, there's a belief that one of the products is underpriced. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the competition is selling at a certain price, so this company has to sell at a certain price, and it's suggested that perhaps by using ABC costing, we might be able to find out where in here the problem lies because we have to fix this loss. Well, how do we fix it? That's the problem, right? So here are the activity cost pools that the company uh, you know, that we're following has decided to use and we can see what our activity cost pools here are. We have customer orders at the batch level, product design at the product level, order size at the unit level, customer relations at the customer level, and finally a category called other. And other is that category where it's overhead that can't be traced to anything. Remember we call it organization sustaining. Well here everything would fall under other. And we have our activity measures. Remember, step one is to define our activities, our activity cost pools, and activity measures. So once we assign all the overhead costs associated with customer orders, our activity measure is the number of customer orders. So our estimate of customer order overhead divided by the number of customer orders will give us a rate per customer order that we can begin to assign. And that's our cost pools. Here is uh, here's our uh, overhead costs that we have to, assi have to assign, and they're both manufacturing and non-manufacturing overhead costs. Notice that this is just overhead costs. So in the production department, notice it says indirect factory wages, indirect labor, right? Factory equipment, depreciation, factory utilities, factory building lease. So there's a million dollars in overhead that needs to be assigned to some of those activity cost pools. In general and administrative departments, we have another 510,000 that needs to be assigned. And in the marketing department, there's 300,000. So we have to, we have total overhead costs of 1.81 million or 1,810,000 that we have to assign to these activity cost pools that we identified earlier. Or if they don't belong in any cost pools, then they go into an other category, which is considered, uh, as we said, uh, organization sustaining activities. So we'll have a look at what we've done here. Recall that we listed uh, in the um, previous uh, view of one of the exhibits, we listed all of our um, overhead costs by department, production department, general administrative and marketing. And across the top, look at this, we have our activity cost pools, customer orders, product design, order size, customer relations, and other. Now, how we get these numbers in here? That's the question. And all the numbers, all the percentages are in here. So let's, let's have a look at what this means. 
what's through through discussions with managers and, and department heads, etc., it was arrived at that indirect factory wages, that 25% of the cost of all indirect factory wages is used up dealing with customer orders. That 40% of all the indirect factory wages is incurred in product design. 20% of it is incurred with items relating to order size. This is a unit cost and that 10% of it is used for customer relations. So we have all of this indirect factory labor and we are told in the beginning that we had, if we uh, uh, look back, we had 500,000 in indirect factory wages and it's decided that 25% of that 500,000 should be assigned to customer orders, 40% to product design, etc. And in each row we have the same thing. Now. The big question is, yeah, but how do you get these numbers? How do you know it's 25%? How do you know it's 40%? Well, here's the deal. The text gives us those numbers as already given. They're just already given. But how we would arrive at them in the real world is we would go to each production manager and each supervisor and we'd say, okay, look, you've got this much in costs over the course of the year that are considered overhead. How would you estimate that they're used up across these different activities. And these are really just estimates. That's the best guess that a manager who has experience in that department would say and look at and go, well, you know, I think it's 25% and 40%. Obviously, the next question would be 25 and 40, not 26 and 39, not 27 and 38. Well, you know, if you sat down and really, really worked at it, you might find that this is not 25% over the course of the year, but 26.3%. That extra bit of accuracy is not worth the cost. So these, in the end, truly are just estimates. The estimates could be wrong. And that is a drawback of activity-based costing is that it relies a lot of time on judgment and estimates. And depending on who's giving the judgment and who's giving the estimate, the judgment and the estimate may be higher or lower than what's required depending how the manager thinks they're going to be compensated for the results. Down here, we can see how uh, here are all the costs listed again, uh, right from the general ledger. And we've taken our percentages that we arrived at in the previous screen. Let's have a look at that again. Here are our percentages. So we've taken the 25% and we multiplied it by the total, the 40% by the total, and we get our costs in here. So that when we add up all the costs across, it should equal what we had to assign. Then when we add down, this is the total within our activity cost pool. The total of all these costs down this column should equal the total of all these costs across this column.